Everybody, thank you for coming out. Um, I'm going to start this talk with three apologies. Apology number one is the standard one for this slot. I am between you and drinks. My job is to give you something to argue about over drinks. Uh, you can argue with me, you can argue with each other, um, but I understand my role in all of this and I promise I need the drink as much as you do. Apology number two. Um, I am an American and I'm about to give a horrifically Americentric talk. And normally I am, I am too good a guest to do this. But the trick is I want to talk about stuff that I'm actually just starting to work on and I haven't had time to sort of go through and be polite and come up with all the UK examples for it, nor do I actually know whether the theory that I want to put forward actually works for the UK. So I am completely acknowledging that I'm going to be the American bastard who sort of gives you the view from my country, not the global view, and hope that by apologizing for it ahead of time, uh, that, that somehow makes it better. I'm not sure that it does, but I'm going to say it in the hopes that it does. And then the third thing is an apology specifically to Rebecca, which is this has absolutely nothing to do with the description uh, within the program, um, because I don't think I gave her a description, and she sort of trusted that I would talk about what I normally talk about, but this talk is actually all about mistrust, and, and not just mistrust in me, which is a very, very good idea, but institutional mistrust. This is a graph that I'm spending a lot of time thinking about lately. This is a graph from Pew Research, and it's a synthesis of a number of studies in the US looking at people who say that they have some or a lot of faith in government. And you'll notice that this graph has a very distinctive pattern to it. In the late 1950s, when we were having our post-war boom and inventing rock and roll and life was good in suburbia, we had very, very high trust in government in the US. Um, we impeached a president, and you'll note that that tends to erode your trust a little bit, that's a Nixon over there. But things just keep getting worse. Uh, other than an ill-advised war, which has a nice way of bumping up trust in government, we have been on the steady decline. And so we have gone from a strong majority of people trusting in government to a very, very low level at this point in time. And what's interesting is that it's not just government. If you ask us who we mistrust, more than anything else in the US, we will tell you Congress. They're probably the least trusted entity we can deal with, except possibly talk show hosts. But if you look sort of across the board, the US has had falling trust in almost every form of institution over that period from about 1958 to the present. What's really interesting, and to me sort of shocking, is that the only institutions that are rising in trust in the United States are the police and the military. And this scares me quite a bit because that actually reminds me a little bit of Egypt where you suddenly end up with a system where people are basically saying we don't trust any of these institutions except for the guys with guns. I'm sure they have our best interests at heart. I've been trying to figure out whether this globalizes at all. And the research on this is, is complicated, it's tricky. Edelman does this survey every year. They've been doing the trust barometer since 2007. But they're a global PR firm, and they're mostly trying to figure out whether you trust big brands. Uh, I do like it in the sense that they think that the UK is even less trusting than the US, <laughs> and they do think we're on a, a general trust decline. Probably the more realistic work on this uh, is the World Values Survey. And the World Values Survey breaks out in sort of an interesting way. Uh, Germany, Northern Europe, Scandinavia, increasing trust, increasing trust in government. Uh, over the period of the last 25 years or so, most of the rest of the OECD, most of the developing world, lowering trust in governments and of other institutions. So I'm, I'm in no way trying to make the case that everybody is growing mistrustful, but I am trying to make the case that mistrust is a big and real problem that we should be thinking about. And there's a lot of possible reasons for this mistrust. I mean, me personally, I favor an explanation that blames Reagan and Thatcher. I, I think having a nice long <laughs> run of people telling you that government can do nothing and then trying to demonstrate that government can do nothing goes a long way towards eroding trust. Uh, I think more access to media has a lot to do with erosion of trust. This is really where Moises Naim goes on this. Naim basically says, look, we've had these revolutions, access to information, mobility, much greater opportunity for most people, much broader life choice. And it makes it possible to basically look around the world and say, I could live a very different way. Things could be very, very different for me. That has a way, he thinks, of eroding the power of very large institutions. Um, 
Ivan Krashchev, uh, fun guy, Bulgarian, uh, probably the least trusting people in the world, goes even <laughs> further and, and says, look, we, we can demonstrate that you would be extremely ill-advised to have trust in government because the government actually has much, much less power than we do over much larger structural forces, particularly market forces. In the wonderful little book, Ivan basically says, look, all you people in Europe marching in the streets, give it up, forget about it. You're asking for the end of austerity, your governments can't end austerity, the, the market is going to beat you up so badly, who should you march against? You can't. You'd be marching against an abstract force, there's absolutely no hope, go away. Uh, and, and so, I, let me just say, I, I actually sit on a board of directors with, with both these guys, and I gotta tell you, it's a real barrel of laughs. I mean, we sort of, you know, look at this, you know, civilization is falling apart. So, I, 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 I am interested in trust as a way of explaining a lot of what we talk about as sort of a crisis in civics. This is very much sort of in vogue in the US, sort of talking about this idea that civics is falling apart, very low public participation, often pulled out through things like voter turnout. And you can either look at this and say, shame on us, we're doing a terrible job of being citizens, or you can look at mistrust and essentially say, why would I really mobilize to vote for membership in an institution that has a 9% approval rating? Do I really care all that much if I think that this institution is not particularly powerful and not particularly effective? And so a lot of what I've been sort of thinking about these days is, can we take other forms of civic activity seriously? Because when you look and you essentially say youth are disaffected, they don't want to be involved with civics, it's clearly missing the point of many, many young people who are involved in volunteering, who are involved on a local level, who are involved in protest movements. What you're really seeing, I think, is people essentially saying, look, I am so mistrustful of these institutions that you want me to participate in that I'm simply not going to do that. But if you can give me another way to participate that feels meaningful, where I feel like I could actually be effective, I'm absolutely willing to step up and sort of make the change. <laughs> so this is the somewhat crazy case I want to try to make to you, and skeptical Ghanaian child is here to help me with this. I want to try to make the case that mistrust is an amazing and almost infinitely renewable civic asset. That if we can simply look at mistrust as not this barrier we have to overcome, but actually look at mistrust as this incredibly powerful force that if we can figure out how to harness, actually becomes a really interesting path towards civic change, we have the possibility of seeing the extent to which there really is civic revitalization taking place and which you could build a very, very different vision of civics. So this is the crazy proposition that I want you to run with me on. And by the end of this, we can have a drink and you can tell me that I'm completely full of it or, or that you've come around and that this is an interesting way to think about this. So here's my case. If mistrust is a massive force that is sort of changing people's political opinion, if it's not just this generation, but is intergenerational, if it's affecting not just trust in government, but trust in a large range of institutions, there's sort of three possible responses, at least three possible responses that we might want to consider. One is that we might want to look at the ways that people work within existing systems and say, how can I be most effective given that I don't trust these institutions very much? I knew PowerPoint was going to screw up my slides. Here is how PowerPoint has screwed up my slides. This is supposed to be a very pretty equation. It is a rewrite of an equation from 1958 by Anthony Downs on the calculus of voting. And the idea behind this is Downs is trying to figure out why would anyone ever bother to vote? And he says, well, it's perfectly rational because economists are perfectly rational. You look, you see what's the probability that my vote is going to make a change. You look at the size of the benefit that that change would have for you. And then you essentially say, is that worth the cost that it's going to take me to vote? And you do that, and it doesn't make any sense at all. You do that, and you basically say, it is so rare that my vote in an election is actually going to swing the election that no one votes for that reason. We must be voting for some other reason. And so a bunch of theorists, including uh, Overshook, come in 1968, and they add this D to the equation. They basically say, no, 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 no. It's not just the probability of benefit, it's the probability of benefit plus this notion of civic duty. 
If we just take seriously this notion that we all have a duty to civic participation, that helps us explain why people participate in systems, even if their vote is not going to be the decisive vote. And so Anthea Watson Strong, very, very smart woman over at Google, trying to figure out how to make civics better, comes back and says, great, I'm going to think of civics in this way. As long as the probability of having a benefit, plus this sense of duty for civic protection I have, is greater than the cost it takes me to take a civic act, I will take that act. And some cool ideas fall out of this. If you want to get people more involved with civics, there's three things you can do. You can make civics less costly. You can try to make it easier for people to participate. You can try to find a way to make people feel like they're going to be efficacious within the system. We're actually going to have the benefit that we're looking for. Or we can basically say, look, I don't know if you're gonna have the benefit, but you're gonna feel really good about this. It's your duty to participate in the system. And when I look around at the work that people are doing in the field, a lot of it plays with these three different axes. A lot of terrific work out there is being done around this concept of trying to figure out how you lower the cost of action. Now, I, I, I am speaking in giant theoretician generalities here. Everybody who sees themselves on the slide, please don't get upset that you're being put solely into one box. But Catherine, like the reason I'm talking about this, right, is you know, one of the things that Code for America does very, very well is thinks about this question of how government makes services more efficient, how they're doing better responsiveness, how to make it significantly easier for someone to have a positive interaction with government, I view that as a lowered cost theory. Kate, the work that you're doing over at Google, very much around this question of can Google make it easier for you to go and vote, for you to participate in an election, very clearly sort of a lowered cost strategy. So I think a lot of these are simply looking at this and saying, can we take this system, make it more efficient, that's a good way forward. There's lots of people fooling around on the duty side of it. This is where we get truly Amerocentric. Lots and lots of duty strategies basically say, can we reinforce almost these sort of ritualized behaviors? Can I show off that I voted? Or can I get people so passionate about their local community, their interest group, that in one fashion or another, this is driving us to civic participation because of loyalty to that group in one fashion or another? So here's the problem with these two. If we don't trust the institutions in the first place, lowering the cost of interacting with them may not actually be all that helpful. If we're essentially saying, I don't believe this institution is particularly helpful, I don't believe that it has legitimacy, I don't believe that it's particularly effective, lowering that cost of participation is not necessarily gonna be the key thing that gets us over the hump. We might have more encounter with it, we might have more exposure with it, perhaps if those encounters go significantly better, we're going to start winning back some of that trust. But that strikes me as a very, very tall hill to walk up. This is not a trust equation that has changed in the last three or four years. This looks to be a 40 or 50 year change. Simply reducing the cost, to me, seems like a very hard way to go. And to me, duty, which I see a lot of my friends, my dear friend Eric Liu, uh, is all about patriotism, is all about increased civic engagement. And I just don't buy it. Uh, I think so much of what's going on is people looking at institutions and saying they're not as effective, they're not as powerful, they're not as wonderful as I want them to be. I think trying to increase duty in many cases puts us in this really terrible place where we're trying to make people feel very bad about their behavior. We're essentially saying you're not a good person for being sufficiently engaged. If you would only pull yourself up, up by your bootstraps and be a proper civic actor, uh, we'd all be much better off. And, and I think instead we're trying to fight against a very large trend. So here's where I get excited. I'm excited around this question of, can we help people figure out how to be effective within these systems? And I'm trying very, very hard to follow Tom's gospel of trying to figure out how to actually measure the efficacy of the activities that we're, that we're taking part in. And the trick about all of this is trying to measure efficacy forces you to have a theory of change. You can't simply say, we got 10,000 people out into the streets, therefore we were effective. You can feel really good about getting 10,000 people out into the streets, but unless you have some theory on what those people in the streets are going to do, and you can measure whether that actually happens, or you can measure whether mobilization gets you towards that, it's very, very hard to figure out whether you're going in the right way. 
So a lot of what I've been thinking about the last couple of years are what are these different paths towards change? And we know some of them very, very well. We know that representative democracy, terrifically effective path towards change, except that it's one that we now seem to be mistrusting a great deal. If we essentially say the way that we're going to have change is electing a new leader, electing a new parliament, electing a new congress, but we don't have much faith in that institution, this is a hard way to force people towards change. And the other problem with this is that it's not necessarily a particularly participatory method. Your individual participation doesn't necessarily feel like it moves the needle very far. Now, it moves the needle further if you're involved with a campaign or you're leading a campaign. It moves the needle a lot further if you're a candidate. But for many, many people, this sense of how much can you personally contribute to it, fairly small. And it's also become a highly professionalized field. It's a field where people go into politics, they view this as the career, they view this as, as where they're going. So I think in some ways we're seeing less enthusiasm for change through this method. I spend a lot of time in the human rights field. This is a field in which our theories of change are all about how to win <coughs> victories in the courts. The courts are another institution in which trust is falling over time. This is another place where you find yourself sort of looking at this and saying, am I really going to be able to make change by taking a case to court, by litigating our way through it? While it's an incredibly powerful way to have change on a very large scale, you get a court decision, you have legislation that follows, you have executive enforcement that follows, it's again an extremely professionalized area, very, very hard theory of change for most people to participate in. Fortunately, we're at a moment where there's a whole lot of other ways to change. And here, I'm taking my cue from Lessig. And Lessig shows up in this book a long, long time ago, uh, Code and Other Laws of Cyberspace, and he said something really simple. Look, we think we control society through law, but the truth is we can control society at least four different ways. We can make something legal or illegal. We can make it easy or hard to do through code and other architectures that we put out in the world. We can make it cheaper or expensive within markets. And we can make it socially desirable or socially undesirable. And in fact, when we try to control people's behaviors, we generally use all of these things at the same time. They're much more powerful used together. My basic contention is that we don't spend enough time thinking about those three leftmost, rightmost on your side, levers of change. And that particularly at a point of institutional mistrust, those levers of change start looking extremely strong. Code is a really interesting lever of change. When you start saying, I don't trust institutions, therefore I'm going to try to find ways to put really good encryption software out in the world so I can actually secure my communications because I don't feel I can persuade my government to stop spying on me. That's a code response. It takes something that's fairly hard to do right now and tries to find a way to make it significantly simpler. And for people who don't have a lot of faith of working within those political institutions, this may seem to be a very good way to work for change. Probably only to, open to a very small number of people. Most of us are not writing the newest incarnation of PGP, but for some people it looks like a very powerful method of change. Markets are an incredibly popular and powerful method of change. You see the whole rise of social entrepreneurship in many cases, what people are trying to do is make change by essentially saying, look, I'm not going to be able to reform the laws. I don't think I'm going to be able to get taxis correctly regulated. So we'll just found a company. We'll found Uber. And we'll try to force a change out there in the market. In my country, we can't seem to get reasonable behavior change uh, around auto emissions. Fine. Great. Tesla. We'll make an affordable electric automobile. And once we actually get to the point where it's affordable by a lot of people, we'll have massive change on this and we'll use markets to go for it. Does it work? Does it not? Lots of interesting questions about this. Markets want you to make a profit. Making a profit is often uh, at odds with making change. Very, very hard to figure out how you're doing on those multiple bottom lines, <laughs> but clearly a place that people end up going when they don't feel like they're being effective through the existing institutions. Changing norms is probably the one that, that we spend the most time studying. And, and, and for those who, who are getting the, the reference to bad American sitcoms, um, that's actually not just a norm 
joke of norms from Cheers, but it's actually one of the best studied norms change campaigns. The Harvard Alcohol Project decided that they wanted people to adopt the Scandinavian innovation, which was the designated driver. We live in a, a very heavy driving society, huge problems with driving while drunk. And so the whole idea was how do we introduce this new norm that it's not a good idea to drink and drive, that the designated driver is a good way to have it. And so the Harvard Alcohol Project had one of the leading sitcoms, which happened to be set in a bar, start introducing the notion of the designated driver. And, and not as a good thing. Actually, the episode where they bring it in, Norm complains terribly that he has to drink water instead of drinking beer because he is the designated driver. But it turns out to be a phenomenally influential way to get people thinking about a behavior change, which is not about a legal change. It was already illegal to drive while drunk, but to get to a norm change of what people actually do day to day. And a huge amount of what happens around online activism is focused around this idea of norm change. How do we try to change people's perceptions? How do we try to change what people think is the right way to do? When you look at something like the Equal Rights Campaign, which went out and encouraged many millions of people to change their icons on Facebook, what they were really trying to do was show that there were a lot of people whose minds had changed around marriage equality. So for people who are sort of going on Facebook and saying, is this an issue people really care about? Is this an issue people are really paying attention to? You were suddenly confronted by some large percentage of your friends saying, no, actually I take this very seriously and I'm going to make a change about it. It's extremely lightweight, it looks very thin, it's pretty easy to interpret as slacktivism, but if you start asking in terms of, am I changing people's norms over time, it suddenly becomes potentially compelling. And sometimes norms change is what you need. In the United States, we're having terrible, <laughs> terrible problems with police violence against African American men. This is not a law change. We don't need different laws that prevent police officers from shooting on our men. What we do need is a long-term norms change around how African-American males are perceived, which is a, 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 an enormous problem in my country. And unfortunately, I could fill many, many, many slides with examples of where this is coming from. So this takes us to this example that I wanted to show off. This is a pair of images um, that became quite famous after Michael Brown got shot in Ferguson. Uh, so we have uh, a, an unarmed young man, now a very complicated story about what happened before he got shot. But this was a reaction to the media portrayal. After Michael Brown got shot, media do what media do these days. They went onto his Facebook page and they looked for photos to illustrate stories. And they used this photo. <coughs> and in this photo, he shot from below He's flashing a peace sign, but many of the newspaper articles said that he was flashing a gang sign. He looks, you know, his age is sort of ambiguous, but he definitely looks uh, like a grown-up. He doesn't necessarily look like a teenager. Activists very quickly said, so why did you choose that picture? Is that really the right picture to portray Michael Brown? Because in the same Facebook feed, and around <laughs> about the same time, you have this photo of this sort of pudgy kid uh, in a high school jacket, looks significantly younger. Um, you had both of these, but you chose the left one instead of the right one. And activists started putting up a very specific Twitter meme where they took two photos, and they both came out of your photo stream, and one was designed to make you look dangerous, and one was designed to make you look like you see yourself. Uh, and the hashtag associated with this was, if they gun me down, which picture would they use? Now, this is a norms-based theory of change. This is looking at this and essentially saying the ongoing problem in American society is how African-American males are perceived. If we want to go after this change, we have to go after the media, we have to go after this sort of large area of exposure. If we want to have this change, we need to gain attention, we need to put this issue on the agenda, we need to win a battle of framing. We need to be able to say our interpretation of this, that the media systemically is not paying attention to our side of this, that that gets traction. Then we want to figure out, is that changing attitudes over time, which we're only going to see out of behavioral 
change. A lot of the work that I'm doing is trying to figure out, can you measure this and can you quantify this? And we think the way that you can do this is by looking at campaigns like this, looking at who they're impacting in terms of reach, looking at how mainstream media ends up picking up these ideas as a way of thinking about agenda, doing words, work with word frequencies and sort of counting word occurrence to look at what frames dominate within this, and then looking to surveys and to actual behavioral change over time. So a lot of the work that I'm doing in my lab is around this question of can we build tools that allow you to track attention to these different campaigns? Can we figure out how they're getting picked up in the media, how they're getting amplified? This is looking at, at, at two campaigns in the US, both around uh, police violence and the ways in which they've sort of ended up reinforcing and not reinforcing each other. Black Lives Matter is this idea that has been coming back again and again. I Can't Breathe, which is very specifically around the chokehold death of Eric Garner, had currency within that situation. It hasn't gone any further than that. But it's also showing us how hard it is to actually sort of move the needle. When we look at Black Lives Matter, as compared to larger discussion of Ferguson, it's basically invisible. This has been something that's been very, very popular within the social media frame. It doesn't show up when we hold it up against a mainstream media frame, at least in terms of absolute value. What is interesting is that when we start getting into a different form of analysis, we're often able to figure out how social media does, in fact, have an impact. This is another way of looking at all the stories for two months around Ferguson. So we took all the newspaper stories we could get using the Media Cloud tool, and we started clustering them together. And the way that we cluster them together is based on linguistic coincidence. So if two sources are using the same words, we ended up putting them very, very closely together. And you can pivot the graph between the sources and the words. So this whole area over here, looking in the green, <coughs> is getting convened around these words. And what's very interesting here is this word militarization. This is an idea that the comedian John Oliver really brings into play. You can actually see John shows up right next to it. John <laughs> Oliver gets up and does his weekly comedy show and says, look, of all the things that are really crazy going on with Ferguson, it's the fact that you cannot tell the US police away from the military. You simply can't distinguish the two. All this military equipment has gone into the police and then we can see this and watch this sort of resonate throughout the media dialogue. There's a whole cluster of the media that ends up picking this up, ends up sort of reinforcing this over time. It's not the whole media. There's other clusters of the media that simply don't pick up this language at all. They end up with a very, very different frame for how to talk about it. The reason we think this is important, the reason we think this is useful, is that all of this social media-based, norms-based change works on this idea of saying, can I give you my interpretation of this situation and can I get you talking about it? And we are starting to see ways that we might be able to track how someone introduces that language, brings it in, potentially sort of structures the dialogue over time. That was point one. Points two are way, way, way faster. So point one was, look, if you don't trust these systems, you're less likely to participate in them. You're gonna look for other ways to participate that may be through looking for change through code, through markets, through norms. My hope is that we have some interesting ways potentially to track change through norms. Here's two other ideas that come out of this. If you don't trust the institutions, one of the temptations is to look for a way of sort of deinstitutionalizing the whole space. And I would argue that this is the excitement that people had about the internet as a space for social change starting in the early 1990s. When you have the sort of raw cyber utopianism of someone like John Perry Barlow, this really comes from the sense of these rules don't apply, the existing institutions aren't in this space, we can start from scratch and we can move in an entirely different direction. How's that worked out for us? We've ended up with Tim Berners-Lee starting very, very explicitly with a vision of a World Wide Web in which everyone's a publisher. Everyone has a web server, everyone's putting up their own content. We very, very quickly ended up at a point of centralization where we're all creating content, but we're creating it in this very centralized and controlled fashion. And what's ended up happening is that this potentially highly decentralized area has ended up creating its own institutions, which by the way, we now mistrust. 
So we now have this space that was all supposed to be about it couldn't be centralized, it couldn't be institutionalized. And the crazy bit of it is even the most decentralized participatory institutions, they're still institutions. If you watch what Wikipedia is dealing with right now, they are dealing with the fact that you essentially have to be a professional Wikipedian if you want to participate in that community at a certain level. It has become its own institution with its own institutional structure. Participation for the average uh, participant has gotten much, much more difficult. That centralization, which has allowed it to scale, has changed the nature of what it means to participate in it. And I think for many people, the bloom has sort of gone off the rose as far as is this now an anti-institutional institution, maybe it is its own, in fact, institution. So for me, one of the questions that comes out of this is, do any of the new things that people want to do in decentralizing, whether it's Bitcoin, whether it's mesh networks, whether it's even Movin's Freedom Box, do any of these have an architecture that somehow resists centralization? <coughs> because with all of these other architectures where we've sort of said, we don't trust the telephone company, we don't trust the newspapers, we want to put this all in our hands, we want to decentralize it, we all get lazy and we all get centralized again. I use Gmail. I am too lazy to run my own mail server, I am too lazy to, to deal with my own spam, and that laziness has now put me in a situation where I'm trusting an institution, which to be perfectly frank, I do not trust. Mm. But this is where we've ended up in this space. We've had this incredible hope of, of decentralization that has very, very quickly aligned us with these large institutions, which have uh, unfortunately a history of letting us down. And so one interesting possibility coming out of this is that if we go into decentralization with this very conscious knowledge that as we centralize, we end up building these institutions that we probably shouldn't trust, we have a very interesting political motivation to go after these decentralized systems. Suddenly looking at them, not just because they're technically cool, but looking at them as a way of saying, look, if we are embracing this idea that mistrust is a social force, trying to get involved with these and trying to politically build them so that they are not centralizing is a wise direction for us to go. I promise the lower two would be significantly shorter. Last one. This is the one that I'm really excited about right now. I think <coughs> one of the best ways to harness mistrust is to try to figure out how to make skepticism and trying to figure out how to monitor the institutions we're skeptical of, the default political stance. So here I lean on Dr. Steve Mann. I, I love the fact that Steve is the guy who more or less invents wearable computing as we know it. Um, but not only does he hate Google Glass, but he also has this wonderful way of like making it clear that he is not wearing Google Glass. Uh, he, he is not, in fact, the sexy person with glass on in the background. He, he's all about his wearable computer being very intrusive because, in part, he wants you to think about the fact that he has a camera on his face and that it's pointing at you. Because man's main philosophical contribution is this idea of surveillance. And surveillance is this idea that lots of us with cameras looking up might be able to start counterbalancing very, very powerful people with cameras looking down. And it's potentially a very compelling idea, and it's one that gets more and more compelling when we have more devices and better connection going forward. So where this has taken me personally in my work recently is to Sao Paulo, Brazil. And the reason I'm working in Sao Paulo is the alignment of these three factors. Sao Paulo elected this really interesting guy, mayor. His name is Fernando Haddad. He's the former um, minister of education. Comes in to the Sao Paulo government and says, look, I'm going to do something a little unusual, but I'm going to publish 120 tangible, actionable goals. And I want you to hold me to them. And if I don't live up to these, don't reelect me. That's fine. But here they are. Here's a 300-page book. Here are my goals. The reason he does this is that this guy, Odette Grejou, who's the founder of the World Social Forum, is whispering in his ear and basically sort of saying, you got to do this. This is how we want politicians to be accountable in the future. And I have this network called Rede Nossa Sao Paulo, network of our Sao Paulo, of thousands of community activists who want to take you up on this. And so we got invited to come in and build the tech. And the tech that we're building is a system called Promise Tracker. And Promise Tracker is very, very simple. What it basically says is pick something in your community that you care about. 
one of the big things that we've been going out and, and doing with people is, is playgrounds. Do your children have a safe place to play? Let's go out and map them, put them on a map, let's talk about what's working there, what's broken with the infrastructure, what needs help, and let's take this map and do a number of different things with it. We can go to the government and we can say, look, you are not living up to your promises. We can go to the media and essentially say, look, here's what's going on with the state of playgrounds in the city. We can also go to the community and try to figure out how to organize around it. Can we fix this problem ourselves? Our tool is incredibly generic. It's basically a survey builder. It allows you to pick something that you want to monitor. It allows you to design your own survey, and then it allows you to do the geocoded, geolocated survey. It outputs the map, it outputs the images, it outputs data tables, and it outputs a way of you sort of building a narrative through this. But here's the logic behind this. At a moment of very, very high mistrust, there's an enormous power associated with saying to people, your job is to try to make sure that these people live up to their promises. If you don't trust the press to hold the government responsible, and in fact, press trust is one of the big things that has fallen down, can you, with a small group of your friends, start organizing ways to, in little ways, collect data and try to hold authorities responsible? And are there ways, by putting out that ability to sort of build this campaign, have other people adopt it, have other people download the software, can that start turning into a joint effort to try to ensure that citizens feel like they actually have some voice in trying to make sure that authorities are listening to them, authorities are living up to those promises over time. It's really small efforts, but one of the big things that we're hoping out of it is that people are going to end up feeling that by taking on this idea of monitorial citizenship, they're finding out in many cases that things are actually significantly better than they thought. We're finding that when people go out and do this, they pick an issue where they feel like the government is horribly falling down on the job. And then what they actually find by going out and monitoring it is that the problems are much more isolated, much more contained than they had initially thought. They also find themselves coming up with tangible solutions that they want to try to figure out how to bring into the process. And what's exciting about doing this in the Sao Paulo context is you have a government that's actually saying, look, we want you, we need you, and we now have a direct channel to figure out how this ends up being feedback that comes back into government. So look, <coughs> long day, I am the guy between us and drinks. I don't know if it's really hot up here or in general, but I'm sweating at this point. Here are my big points. I think mistrust is here to stay. And I think if we don't think about these questions of civic participation, taking mistrust seriously, we're going to keep being disappointed by efforts that don't work out. I think a lot of the popular approaches to changing civic engagement don't take mistrust seriously enough. And I think anything that essentially lectures us on have a better sense of duty, come on, step up, be a good citizen, is missing a very large societal trend. I think we need to look really seriously at these, to me, perfectly rational ways that people are looking outside of mistrusted institutions and looking for other paths to change. And I think we need to recognize those activities, whether they're coding, whether they're starting socially responsible businesses, whether they're running a campaign to try to change a norm by using internet memes, I think we have to view them as potentially legitimate and we have to evaluate them based on their actual success and failure of what they're trying to do. And finally, I think if we can start getting our heads around this idea that mistrust is this near infinitely renewable resource, we can actually start thinking through strategies of citizenship like monitorial citizenship that are actually empowered and strengthened by it. So that's the case that I'm trying to make. Now is a great time to argue with me. I think arguments are best with drinks in our hands. <laughs>